It's a neurocognitive training program uh, that actually uh, uses uh, a neuro device that monitors the brain of the student. It's a wearable neuro device. It has a very, very good attention algorithm in it. And it allows the students to activate games by being engaged. We guide them to being in their maximum state of attention and then that activates certain elements. It activates the game, but it also activates certain elements in the game. So they're actually controlling the game by mind alone. And the game actually teaches them a skill uh, that supports executive function. It teaches them to reduce impulsive behavior, make good decisions. The program now is shipped globally in 10 different languages. It is the number one neurocognitive uh, program for ADHD students. I actually created that genre wow. way back in the early 1990s. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Saki and we are on site at the Transformative Technology Conference down in Palo Alto in California. We are very grateful for our partnership with them this weekend at their conference. We are sitting down with a bunch of the thought leaders at the conference. We have Peter Freer joining us from Freer Logic. How you doing, man? Uh -huh. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming on the show. Really uh -huh. appreciate it. I enjoy it. I love the uh, Transformative Tech Conference. I love the atmosphere they've created here. Yes. And it's really nice to be here. And actually, for your logic fits perfectly into it. And you know, as we as we talk about what you're doing with for your logic, the neuro cybernetics wearables that are not a, 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 a funny looking like Google Glass style headband, the reason why that didn't succeed just looks a little too funny, wasn't ready, uh, wasn't quite there at the time that, w that what people weren't ready for it. But the, the, we'll, get to, we'll get to what you're building. I want to ask you about you first. You know, who are you? How did you even end up caring about you know, uh, neurotech and wearable technology and mapping uh, the brain? Yeah, how did that even happen with your life journey? It's a long story. I'm a former educator. And when I started teaching back in the mid-1980s, I had students who could not pay attention. And at that time, there was really no formal diagnosis, no formal description. They called it minimal brain dysfunction. And uh, they eventually called it ADHD. But I had a math, science, physics, computer programming background from university. And uh, I thought, well, I will make a program that will fix these students. So I set about doing it working three jobs, six days a week. School teachers don't make much money. And I came out with, in 1994, Play Attention. Mm -hmm. This is the first company I started. And uh, you can see that at playattention.com. It's a neurocognitive training program uh, that actually uh, uses uh, a neuro device that monitors the brain of the student. It's a wearable neuro device. The program now is shipped globally in 10 different languages. It, it is the number one neurocognitive uh, program for ADHD students. I actually created that genre wow. way back in the early 1990s. And I actually got to work with some folks at NASA because NASA was using neurotech to train astronauts to pay better attention in states of hypo and hyperarousal. Mm, and uh, mm. we were fortunate enough to adapt the technology. NASA's spinoff magazine f featured me a couple of times. And then we got patents based on our enhancements to what uh, they had been doing. But we were limited there just to that space, to the ADHD space. By the way, it was tested by Tufts University School of Medicine in three randomized controlled studies, and we knocked it out of the park. They're all published in three peer-reviewed journals, and our students increased in attention, executive function, uh, behavioral control, and academic performance, as well as social performance as well, too, because that's a, an area that they have that's troubling for most ADHD students. Will you teach us about play attention, right? Pay, pay, play attention. Play attention. Play attention, which is, I like that. I like the. The, the, the title, the name there. Now, w with Play Attention, what were they doing? Because there, there was a there's a hardware component and a software component. There, you had a game that they were playing, and you were monitoring their neural signatures. Yeah. Okay, so then, what? Um, how was the wearable that you made then able to actually um, monitor things like attention or executive function? And also, what was the software like that they were? That yeah, they that's the right question. Yeah, the Neuromonitor that was used, I developed to wear on the arm. 
And of course, I was told initially I, I wouldn't be able to do it because the signal's so small. Mm -hmm. So I uh, worked on it for about three years, and we finally came up with something that has a very, very good attention algorithm in it. And it allows the students to activate games by being engaged, right? Uh, we uh, guide them to being in their maximum state of attention, and then that activates certain elements. It activates the game, but it also activates certain elements in the game. So they're actually controlling the game by mind alone. And the game actually teaches them a skill uh, that supports executive function. It teaches them to reduce impulsive behavior, make good decisions, uh, even something as simple as finishing homework. We actually have the academic bridge where they can work on homework in real time and the attention monitor is monitoring how much attention they're paying to their homework and it alerts them when it's not enough to get homework done in a normal amount of time. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's a teaching program. So once they've learned how to do it, they don't need us anymore, right? They uh, get the skill sets that they need. And we've done this, uh, at, you know, Tufts, uh, the Tufts studies were really kind of key in uh, learning about how this actually works. I lectured on this at uh, the United Nations because I had done uh, work for the International Atomic Energy Agency of the United Nations to teach nuclear operators how to pay better attention. Uh, so what we do is, of course, add that neuro component. So Tufts thought, well, it's nonsense. You don't need a neuro component. Brain training is brain training is brain training. So in their tests against us, they pitted us against games like uh, Lumosity, brain games that people can play, and then a non-intervention group. I think brain training is brain training. You don't need a neuro component. <coughs> so when we put the neuro component in, uh, especially among this population, we had great success. Uh, when we were compared, uh, the brain training group, uh, our group, uh, excelled in all those areas I previously mentioned. The brain training group excelled in none. They had no increased ability in any of those areas. As a matter of fact, they required an average of nine milligrams increase in their medication just to stay in school. And that was about on the same level as the non total non intervention group. So it tells you that the neuro component, having the person be engaged is a critical component to changing uh, behavioral outcomes and cognitive outcomes. The fact that I can, I can pull your attention in and mandate that to operate the game that you're playing to learn a certain skill is critical for you to make a change. And that we have found to be a key factor in training da Vinci robotic surgeons, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Olympic athletes. <coughs> we do all of this now um, based on the fact that we've been uh, doing that type of training for years. We also can do it remotely. So let's say you're in San Francisco mm. and I'm back in North Carolina at our offices and you have my armband. I can train you in real time. I could train 20 people in real time from across the globe all with a single uh, application that we have now. So we not only have specialized in, in training in that area but also uh, being able to do it remotely um, for a wide population. But that limited us to that ADHD realm, uh, you know, kind of a neurocognitive training element. So we moved out of that in 2005. I thought, you know, there is no way that uh, we're going to be able to get this into a consumer realm unless we have more than the body-based armband. Uh, I'd like to use it in cars, so I actually created a steering wheel for Jaguar Land Rover. Uh, and you could grab the steering wheel, and it would uh, monitor your engagement, your neuro... Um, uh, information was being distributed uh, or obtained through the steering wheel. Well, I got back to Detroit, and the guys in Detroit said, we wear gloves in the wintertime. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I had to come up with a new uh, model, a new form factor. And I watched a movie called Contact with Jodie Foster, yeah. Carl Sagan. Great if you're movie. a nerd, yeah. you, you, I've watched that movie I don't know how many times. Mm -hmm. Fell asleep. Woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I shook my wife awake and I said, I know what I'm doing. I know how to do this. So I devised an array series that would be able to monitor the brain from a distance. So in effect, we don't need contact with the head any longer or the body. So I put it in a headrest and we call it a neurobiomonitor because officially uh, EEG... Um, requires attachment. It, it denotes that you have sensors attached to the head, and we don't. So we call it a neurobiomonitor. And we're able to get enough um, signal from uh, the driver to 
to determine drowsiness, uh, to determine cognitive load. Uh, so if they're trying to text and drive and it becomes dangerous, we can tell them. The car becomes conscious then of the driver. We've kind of dubbed it at this point the conscious car because it becomes aware of what your state is and then assists you. So it's essentially passive. Nothing ever is injected into the driver. It just listens like the microphones that we're wearing listen to our voice. This listens for your brain signal, but they're passive until such a time that you're uh, having a problem with getting too sleepy to drive. And then the car can alert you. It will vibrate your seat, maybe wa waft a coffee scent through the car, or uh, even uh, uh, tell you, right? You're too dry and drowsy to drive. It's time to pull off the road, get some coffee, something like that, so that it becomes a safety feature uh, in the vehicle. In autonomous driving, which is coming up, it will also uh, monitor the driver for driver engagement because it's still critical that uh, you're not uh, reading a book and uh, while the car is uh, driving because we've already seen uh, some extreme accidents happen uh, under the current situation with uh, autonomous vehicles. Let's talk about how the technology works. So how can you, via a wearable, so tap into some of the nervous system in the forearm or even like you said without even a wearable the neurobiofeedback how can you do that how does that work so you have uh, the nerves in your body your nervous system runs from the brain all the way down to the tips of your toes and it's all throughout your body you probably didn't even know that you have brain cells neurons in your gut mm -hmm. you have a secondary nervous system in your gut and people often say well I have a gut feeling about that well not that that uh, the neurons there are ever going to write a, a poem or a novel but they uh, are it shows that we have quite a, an active nervous system and we found that if we tune the electronics appropriately we can get it through the body but we have to uh, eliminate things like uh, muscle tension and other artifact heart rhythm, that kind of thing, because those are very strong elements to pick up a very faint signal. Because when you look at uh, neuro signal, um, it's, it's formed because the brain is comprised of billions of cells called neurons. And the neurons have to talk to each other to function. They, they make minor networks and major networks throughout the brain. So you have the internet going on in your brain. And when they talk to each other, they shoot uh, uh, a neurotransmitter uh, between the cells. And it either activates or, or uh, deactivates the cell next to it, right? And uh, that neurotransmission in itself is so small, you can't measure one neuron. It's just way too tiny. Unless you stuck a microfine um, sensor probe down there, Elon Musk says that's a good thing to do. And eventually, we probably will do that uh, when they can make it convenient enough to do. But uh, just the thought of sticking wires into one's brain is kind of repulsive to most people at this point. So right now, we listen uh, to that signal by taking a mass of, of the, the neurons when they fire. So whenever you get an, a brain signal, it is always the summation or aggregate of uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of neurons firing at one time, because that produces enough energy, a field of energy that goes through the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, the meninges, the dermis, and if it pushes or pulls on sensors on the top of the head, that's EEG. Uh, it creates a field of energy. And so what the neurobiomonitor is uh, designed to do is to listen to a field of energy and then parse it down into constituent elements like uh, various brainwave uh, frequencies. Is that making any sense? Yeah, it is. So continue, though, we're, we're right there where you just left off. So if, you're, if, you, if I'm using my, my pillow... Uh, and my pillow is uh, a neuro neurobiofeedback. What is the tool? What, uh, sorry, what is the item that you are using that is collecting the neurobiofeedback? Is it a pillow? What is it? Uh, oh, so in this case, we would use it in the in the vehicles that we're using it in. It's a headrest, so it's oh, located. Oh. You'll never see it. It's in the headrest of your now, car. Now I get it. Now I now now you know why yeah. I'm carrying around a headrest. I opened Peter's <laughs> bag and I was like, "What is going on? Why do you have a car headrest in here?" Interesting. So they so they're so they're just driving, and then what is the what is what is located inside of the headrest of the driver's seat? What is that thing that's there? So there is an array in there, uh, and this is what came through the uh, 
the contact movie, when I watched them use array of radio telescope, arrays of radio telescope to monitor uh, extraterrestrial signal, uh, signal the hundreds uh, if not millions of light years away, uh, we can actually see faint signals. Uh, so I thought, well, by using an array and then tuning the array to the human uh, brain that we would be able to collect enough signal to create algorithms that interpret those signals and give us the state of the driver. So we did uh, testing uh, with auto OEM, right? And uh, in a simulator, we were able to beat the current system, which is called a perclo system. A perclo system is a camera system that looks at how heavy your eyelids are getting and then it tries to, it sets an algorithm on it and says, okay, you're this sleepy based on that. But of course, you're looking at an external physical feature that is apparent uh, well after the fact that the brain has already moved to that state. So we can look at it in real time. So we beat perclose by two to 10 minutes. 10 minutes was our best, two minutes was our worst effort in determining drowsiness. Now, we also use something called the Karolinska uh, sleepiness survey, and, uh, or scale, sleepiness scale, which is a subjective thing. As you would be doing the testing, we would uh, uh, ask you at certain points, how sleepy do you feel? Scale of one to nine. And you would tell us on that scale. The perclose system got zero correlation, and uh, we got 80% correlation. And uh, so not only did we beat it in time, we also beat it in correlation to what people subjectively felt about their sleep. Now some people obviously don't know they're getting drowsy, um, and that's why people fall asleep and go off the road, right? They don't really know. They think they can beat it, or mm -hmm. they don't really know. Yeah. So um, we know we're on the right track, and uh, we expect to be out in uh, uh, vehicle uh, by 2020. We've been at it for two years with auto um, manufacturers and uh, we expect it to be in as a safety feature in, in the not too distant future. Oh my gosh, it's the next seat belt. It is and it's totally, again, totally passive. We don't inject anything into you. There's no yeah. radio wave going into your head. We yeah. just listen and it's, it's a key safety feature. Some uh, auto OEM an don't want to... An array of how is it just listening to the electrical activity? I'm sitting here. Uh, so there's a heavy amplification system behind it mm -hmm. with electronics mm -hmm. that amplify this T tiny signal that comes from the head. So there's amplification, and I can't tell you the secret sauce. Yeah, yeah. Right? But there is heavy amp amplification and heavy filtering that has to go on so that uh, we can actually see what's happening in real time. But so there you're is taking a. Taking the signal that's there and amplifying it. Yeah, just like your microphone does right here. This yeah. tiny microphone is taking this, uh, the vibration of the air coming from me and then obviously amplifies that like crazy and then yeah. feeds it in wirelessly into the camera. Yeah. And it's very much like that. Interesting, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm glad you gave that analogy of the, the next, you know, this next seatbelt or the next, uh, that, what was it, the Israeli car company that got the, um, the uh, au the auto assist for the lane switches uh, now in every single uh, manufacturer. I think they're almost there at least. So, so now it's interesting. There seem to be uh, this is a, this is an important place, especially because the transition to autonomous isn't coming um, so so soon. So there's plenty of a runway probably maybe 10 years, um, and then even after 10, like you said, there's still applications for autonomous. I've got to be honest with you, you're one of the first uh, interviewers I've ever spoken to that actually has a real grasp of what that's like, because all the, and I don't want to get myself in too much hot water here, but a lot of the car companies are projecting that it's around the corner and it's going to be in the next couple of years. And the reality of the technology is that it's just not there. Yeah. And I think you're right, eight to 10 years out we will have and cars have to be interconnected totally. there's going to be a lot of work that's done totally. but everybody wants to keep their stock up so they yeah. say that they're around the corner core, yeah. I just would not uh, personally I would not use it myself right now totally and so then you'll still be around even through the autonomous vehicles monitoring um, the electrical activity the brain now what can you get from the electrical activity of the brain at such a 
at such a distance, even though it's at it's not that far. It's not an EEG. It's it's not you're not wearing the electrodes, but there's this array, and the array is taking what is on the surface of the brain, amplifying it, and you're mostly collecting those big neural activations, like you were talking about, when a lot of the neural infrastructure lights up and you're able to get a big reading from something like that. So what we're looking at is uh, something that's been done for many, many years in the industry. We look at the brain data that are coming from the person and then we interpret that in, to uh, say, is that person drowsy? Is that person angry? Is that person stressed? Is that person paying attention? And there are algorithms written on those data and we've created new ones and we'll keep creating some, but there already have been, there's been a lot of work in that uh, arena already. People have created algorithms to interpret different things. And so that's uh, creating, our, creating our own from this is really the key. So it's not only the electronics, but uh, it's the key to uh, working in an auto situation, which is different than working, let's say in your pillow on your, on your bed. We've actually had a mattress company uh, do that, and I, mm. I'm not allowed to reveal uh, who, the, who that is right now, but... Oh, they're doing a similar, like, array in a, in a bed. Uh, we've done it for them. Oh, And they actually were at Great. CES. So I can, uh, they were at CES a couple of years ago, and they were having races. So you and your spouse or your friend could jump in these beds, and then through an attention algorithm, you could race each other to see who's sleep. Could, to sleep, yeah. Yeah. So that was the the okay. whole idea. Here's that an point. interesting question for you: Is the is is the is what the array is detecting? You were, we we're discussing these kind of like bigger activations and these algorithms that can detect if it's happiness or if it's sadness or if it's if it's drowsiness, etc. Is is this a is the array sensing a if the dr the drowsiness would be something like a a delta, like a deep sleep brainwave, or even like a theta is like getting kind of close to that as well, very like deeper meditative state, versus if they're at like a like a mid-range beta, like just like a faster wave, then do, are you are you getting that? Are you get then they're more awake? Are you getting that kind of data? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So we can parse into respective bandwidths. Delta being the long, slow rolling wave that's usually dominant during sleep. If you have alpha spindles during delta, you have REM sleep, so you're dreaming. Uh, theta is just prior to sleep, as as you mentioned. So we do that, but uh, we also, we have three tiers in Freer Logic. One is automotive. So we do that in automotive. But the other one is consumer tech, which is one of the reasons we're here. And then the third is training. So as I previously mentioned, we also train Da Vinci robotic surgeons, yeah, Olympic yeah. athletes, things like that, uh, so that they can attain better performance. Because, uh, again, three critical catalysts to, to causing prolonged changes in the brain, long-term uh, changes in the brain. One key catalyst is attention. So we can create that through the neuro monitoring, right? The second one that you have to have is challenge. Uh, if I'm going to teach you something new that you're going to retain and to create the new neural networks responsible for it, because we know these are catalysts. We actually know the molecular process behind that. It's called, called the Krebs pro process, cyclic amp response elements and uh, binding proteins. So we know how the brain actually goes about actually sending out messenger RNA and, and saying, here's this new neural network that needs to happen. So we know the molecular structure and, and, and uh, mechanism. So what we do is take a look at the uh, macro. How do we get that to actually happen? Well, one of the key catalysts is attention. The second one is challenge. If I tell you something you already know, you nod your head and go, yeah, I already know that. But if I take you to the limits of your knowledge base, and push you just a fraction further, and I can keep your attention while I'm doing that, mm -hmm. that's challenge, yeah. right? And it forces you to go just a step further. Yep. And we can actually do that with the attention levels Those as well. Those are some of like the most profound m moments of existence is when you unlock that new dimension of thinking, the new, per uh, tool, the new perception, the, uh, 
an augmentation in perception is so fascinating. Brilliantly said. That's yeah. exactly where we're pushing the envelope right now. Yeah. To be able to draw people to do that instead of for years, uh, you know, a golfer is probably one of the best examples. A golfer will go out and hit a bucket of balls doing the same thing he's done for the last 20 years and then he goes and plays a game and he goes, my game still stinks. <laughs> Don't play with because I'm not engaged. I do the same things I do all the time. Neurotechnology can engage us and then with the proper type of training, and this is a, a term coined by uh, Anders Ericsson, who was a University of Central Florida, wrote a tome on, uh, on how we become experts, mm -hmm. right? So he knows uh, exactly and, uh, what the, the technique is um, and he can talk about it. Um, but we're the ones that actually can actually make it happen in, the, in a neuro sense, right? So uh, you have attention and being pulling, engaging the person, and then taking them to uh, a uh, state of challenge. State of challenge, and you can not only take them to the state of challenge about the material they're learning, but you can take them to a state of channel about, uh, challenge about how much attention they're paying to the uh, new material. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. And so the last leg of that tripod is deliberate practice. And the deliberate practice oh. model is Anders Ericsson. Being able to do it with feedback. So now the neurotech is giving you immediate feedback about immediate how engaged feedback. you are. Yeah, yeah. It's giving you f immediate feedback about your challenge level. About how, do you, how, how do you show this feedback? So let's say that... Uh, you're playing one of our uh, one of the ADHD games we use is is called uh, discriminatory processing or even I think an, another good one to use here would be just uh, attention stamina to learn how to prolong how to sustain and direct and prolong our attention a little bit. So during that, we give you a simple character. You push to, to the bottom of the ocean by your attention level. Mm. The more attention you pay, you push the character down, and he's collecting treasure and various articles while he's down there. But we don't let you stay there. Because if I let you stay there, you're on autopilot and become disengaged after a while. So every, and this is in the algorithm, every little while or so, we challenge you to pay a little bit more attention. So there's the attention challenge. If you don't make it, right, he starts floating the wrong way, and you know there's the immediate feedback. I've got to get a little bit more attentive. So then you, if you can catch it, you push him back down. Mm -hmm. So we're increasing your attention to the task. And then secondarily, if you don't make it, I can't do it, it's too hard for me. It just takes you back to your last yeah. most successful level, exactly. but then yeah. it's got to repeat in a cycle, right? Yeah, I yeah. don't let you stay there. Yeah, yeah. Because we okay. know that human beings just produce so much more when you give them that little sense of challenge. Yeah. And that's it yeah. in its most simplest sense. But we, then we give you course material so that if you're learning a new skill like discriminatory processing, time on task, um, short-term memory, working memory, spatial memory, then we also increase the ante, the, the challenge of those games. So you're getting the yeah. challenge of attending to the challenge level in the game so that you're always pushed to your maximum but never allowed to be overwhelmed and fail because that's where people get discouraged and then new uh, neural networks won't form. So this was a key uh, factor when we developed all the neurocognitive training. Because a lot of people have said, and I've, there's a company that just got a huge amount of money because they're creating a little iPad game that you can use in gyros and manipulate down. And it's supposed to develop... Achille you know, Interactive Labs? And I think it is, yeah. Yeah, it's Adam yeah. Gazzelli and Eddie. Yeah, Marcus, and the idea know, is brilliant. guys. But they've kind of uh, isolated attention problems all to attention and some processing problems. The problem with ADHD is that it's vast and that it is a problem of executive function. Not only impulse control, but the ability to make good decisions uh, the ability to pay attention is a still a factor. Mm -hmm. All of these are in there and there's far much more and they actually have to have certain goals uh, and certain skill sets that they just don't have. The ability to finish tasks. If you don't teach these skills, the short, short term memory, working memory, spatial memory, even social cues, if you don't teach them, the students don't arrive at them by osmosis. So it has to be part of the curriculum. That's what I discovered back in the uh, late 1980s and filed patents on being able to do that uh, integration with neurotech because no one had thought of doing it. Everyone was just looking at brainwave patterns and saying if we 
fix these brainwave patterns, the person's fixed. <coughs> it's nonsensical. In a physical sense, if, if I'm trying to teach you something, you know, teaching your, you to improve your brainwaves is not going to necessarily improve your golf game or your basketball game. I have to get you out on the court. We have to give you the challenge. Mm. We have to look at how engaged you are. Training your focus yeah. in general, though, will slowly help in those. In if those you're good at it already, it should make you better. Yeah, yeah. But if I want to make you really good, and this is one of the things we did by using the wearable devices, is that we can allow you now to actually do the activity and we can watch your brain processes as, as you, you do are. it. Now, is the wearable the consumer good? That's the consumer good. It right? is. And so, uh, is that already available? At it's only logic? available right now in the uh, Play Attention games. In the Play Attention. So when, yeah. you, when you order the game, then you're able to get the neurofeedback wearable. Exactly. And, yeah. then, and then the, again, so there's the automotive component, there's the consumer good component when you go through the purchasing of the game as mm -hmm. well. And then, um, what is the cost of the of the game right now? The games uh, for a full program for home use, which is uh, two user licenses, so you could use it with two of your kids at home or your your spouse or yourself, um, is seventeen ninety five, and that 1, is the full seven hundred ninety five. Mm -hmm. That's the full course though. So if you were going to uh, any center that, to get that tutoring, includes all the games. Includes all the games. Includes all the games. Okay. And then, and it includes a, a, a neurofeedback. Device. Neuro, the, and it includes totally free support for your life. So you get an executive function coach, a person that has a master's yeah. in education, and they actually evaluate your data at any time. You send in your data, they do full evaluation, and it's no extra cost. Um, you can have it for professional use for $2,500 essentially, and it's unlimited use. We don't recollect fees. Yeah. Uh, that way, if you went to a tutoring center to try to get tutoring for um, problems, cognitive problems, you would pay between three to eight thousand dollars on the light side. People often take second mortgages on their home to go through these processes, but you don't get as much out of it as you do in the neurotech program because you don't have those extra things that we've kind of combined in there. So, so I want to do a couple power power round questions with you. Now, wh what is, again, is this when I'm wearing your uh, Neurotech device, am I, is, is it right, is it so close to my central nervous system and my central nervous system, my brain is, is able to send that, that electrical signal is able to be detected from something that is closer to my wrist, that your sensitivity is that high? Yeah, this equipment is sensitive down to 100 nanovolts. That's 10 to the minus 9 wow. nanovolts. That's really sensitive, yeah. Well, in addition to that, it has to be coupled with incredible filtering to get out all totally. of the junk, junk that's yeah. between your head and this point in your arm or maybe even on your ankle if you're a golfer. Interesting. And then would you say that then when you are focusing on the diver and the diver is going down in the game and then the you can you can tell the uh, as soon as the focus leaves the diver the diver starts going back up towards the surface and so that's how this game is is is, is being played yeah I, I th this process is very familiar very familiar for me because of vipassana meditation where you just sit and you observe your respiration through your nostrils and mm -hmm. you observe and then your mind wanders and then you go wow i can't believe i just monkey minded for 10 minutes out and about and la la exactly. la and you bring it back to your respiration so it's it's interestingly <clears throat> um, training your focus in a, in a similar way in that sense and just observing just the diver observing just the diver observing just the diver making sure they go down observing just that not letting it go elsewhere so there's about a Very half second instead of wandering for 10 minutes yeah there's maybe a half second latency between what's happening here and then the visualization of the... So the training is like... It's immediate. Immediate, because you see the visualization of you losing your attention. Whereas mm -hmm. with when your mind just wanders, I mean, without a, without a cue, you know, your eyes are just closed and you just go off thinking, oh, emails, phone calls, meetings, this goes, mom, dad, brother, sister. It just goes off. 
sex, food, drugs, your music, it's just everywhere. And so when you have a visual cue, like you said, you said half a second. Half a second latency. That's, that's incredible. Um, then I can totally see how that can also do the peak performance stuff that you're talking about. That's mm -hmm. huge. That can really help people zone in um, to what they want. Well, the third, the third leg of this tripod is training. So we actually have a Lotus app for people who want to meditate. So you sit in front of a Lotus flower and it's closed. And then you hit a deep meditative, relaxed state, much like you're talking about by listening to your breathing cycles. Mm -hmm. um, I used to do that. I'm a martial artist since I was 10 years old, uh, former professional fighter, all of that. So having that ability to see the lotus flower and then going through uh, my engagement to it my in that meditative state you can open the lotus pedal by pedal when i lose the state yeah. the pedal starts to close up that's pretty cool too yeah. so you have this immediacy right in front of you again so you, you can't lose it for 10 minutes you have this right in front of you and you know yeah. where you have to be so it cuts the time down yeah of training yeah. uh, and teaching yourself how to how to do this. It's very interesting. It's insightful. Because 2,500 years ago, we didn't have you know this is only like you said 20 less than 25 year, years old. Um, interesting. Yeah, I can't believe it's also nuts to me that this is. If you would have told me I I only made this yesterday, I would have been like yeah because that that's really the only that's the earliest we could have gotten that sensitivity. But you're like 25 years ago, and I'm like. How is that? What? No, no the, originally we actually had to use helmets, you modified did. helmets. You did in '94 was '94 was helmets, modified helmets. Yeah, and yeah. today I started in 2005. When did you get I started the sensitivity? 2005. Down? 2005. Yeah. yeah. So it's see, been I hard. Wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought, you know, 14 years ago that we could have gotten that sensitivity. But it it also does make sense that we we were around then there. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting, yeah. Uh, co collaboration explorations between um, between our networks of neuroscientists and these sort of uh, peak performance experts, the, the ability to to get instantaneous neurofeedback and then to be able to do cognitive enhancing games is this, this is extremely important. I, I, I the the, gr the gr I, w I always talk about this, but the the, the peak of cognition is around this 23-ish, 24-ish age range. And so right when you're at that age range, um, it, it's, you, can, you can literally start telling, yeah, sir, sure, certain things pick up as though my vocabulary gets stronger over time, I can tell. Um, but it is also true that uh, you can't do your one hour of sleep night and then go and be like ah ha ha the next day it's tough so, yeah. yeah so there's certain things um that if you if you do go and and practice focusing on on your attention on something like meditation or these games and there's so many applications what are some of the future applications um that you look to that you're looking forward to developing well we are working um forming and forming another company that is going to work on communication um and how to uh, one of the patents that I've, I've got uh, that is pending right now is that uh, if we can monitor each other's neural signal without touching and then can communicate it back and forth, mm. we have this ability for nonverbal uh, communication, yes. the groundwork. So that is underway. But in a practical sense, even uh, right now, since we have developed a, a decent drowsiness algorithm, we've reversed it so that... You know, when you were talking about your mind just being so uh, yeah. racing, Monkey racing mind, at night yeah. when I'm lying, uh, and, and this happens to everyone. Uh, I'm trying to go to sleep, yet I'm thinking about all the things that occurred during the day. Then the, my mind wanders for that for a moment. Then it comes back and all the things I have to do tomorrow, and these lists start forming, and then I'm not asleep at all. And I have a very difficult time telling this computer to, to yeah. shut down. Yeah. So we've created the Sleepy Series so that we put the uh, drowsiness detection in reverse so we actually push you into a state of drowsiness. How mm -hmm. can I give you that state? So we actually have one called the Sleepy Beach mm -hmm. app. And Sleepy Beach is just this 3D beach uh, scene you can look at on your cell phone. Mm -hmm. And the sun's up in the sky. And so when you start to, to breathe deeply and relax and move your mind away from That's pretty cool. thought, you'll start yeah. to make the sunset. Set, and, the, yeah. and then the stars start to come up come and up, you'll yeah. be able to raise the moon. 
and uh, we actually have a demo of melatonin that. Melatonin comes in. It is. It's yeah. you're, you're actually teaching your brain to cooperate. I mean, this is one of the, I'm going to lecture here tomorrow, or uh, not lecture, I'm going to speak tomorrow, yes. and uh, we'll demo a little bit tomorrow, too, during the uh, presentation. But the idea is that uh, the brain is, is an organ of reduction. All of this, all of this uh, interaction between us, all of the people around us, is reduced in the brain to the random firing of neurons. <laughs> yeah. It's there. That's our inner universe. Yet we have no control over any of it. Yeah. Right? We don't know how to master this thing, this our core tool. We have no idea how to master it. So we try these physical techniques. We'll try meditation. Then we find, oh gosh, I just wandered off for 10 minutes. That was a waste. Then I get back. I'll go for a couple more minutes. And I wander for five, and then I come back. So now we are giving people the tool they actually need to train this to be one of the most powerful uh, uh, assets they'll ever possess in their life. And one of the uh, points tomorrow is going to be a quiet revolution that I'm, I'm going to talk about. But AARP surveyed, I think, close to 50 or 60,000 of its members and said, out of everything that you want, what is most important to you? Yeah. And of course, you would think, wealth, I got to have yeah. money. Yeah. Wasn't that? Health. Health, yeah. Wasn't that? No, not cognition. Cognition, yeah. keeping my mind sharp, sharp was the number one priority yeah. because you can have all the money in the world, but you've watched your friends dissolve to Alzheimer's. Yeah. They have all the money they want. It's not helping. Yeah. You can have health, but then your mind is going. So it's almost related, but we'll separate it. Yeah. Right? But if my mind stays sharp, sharpness of mind. Yeah, I can so make good decisions and I can live a happy let's life. Let's retain you know, that like 15-year-old homeostatic capacity of the, of the mind throughout our life. That would be fantastic. Um, I wanted to, does, it, does it almost seem as though you're giving people free will? <laughs> we can't give them something that's already theirs. You know, <laughs> what we're giving them the ability to do is to use this tool to its maximum potential. For each individual that's different, you're already really insightful. You've been, you've done a lot. I can tell by the way that you're interacting with me. You know a lot about what we're talking about, and that's uncommon. But you're in this tech world. You ex have experienced a lot. But now, you know, my goal and passion has been to make this thing functional for everyone, and uh, make neurotech functional. But in a car, it functions one way. For training, it functions another. For consumer products to help me go to sleep. Um, you know, at night, it's very practical, but we need to have, you know, this is the time where we can control this thing. This is a time where, as your cognition's peaking around that 23, 24, that you have the ability to play these cognitive enhancing games and retain more of your focus over time that you can offset the onset of neurodegeneration. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is very fascinating stuff. I'm glad we had the chance to to sit down and explore it in a lot of its nuance. Um, is there something else about for your logic that is important to know about? Are you? Well, I'll let you answer that question. I'm I'm curious about the about the the sort of the the neurocybernetics that you were discussing at the beginning as well. You know, is there a way that what your understanding with the algorithms that you have put together that now somebody else can put, you can open source some of that and someone else can potentially um, be able to you know understand the what's going on with brain activity and make something that helps in a different area or field so it's like kind of you know you're making the knowledge map knowledge graph well I think so uh in, in a way, it's possible to do, but in a way, we, we hold patents on the ability to take it from the body and have patents pending on the non-contact use. Mm -hmm. But we will open that up eventually to let people have full use of it because yeah. that's where it's going to produce uh, the best effects, I yeah. think, long term. But I've got to, you have probably a bunch of entrepreneurs that listen to your show, yes. right? So I want to make certain I tell everybody this. I was told that I couldn't do this. I was told by, uh, as a matter of fact, there is a venture company here. It's uh, Jazz Ventures, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Jazz said, we don't think you can do it. You know, we don't think you can do what you're saying you're doing. Yet we've already gotten uh, 
uh, awards for, and we're in one of the top 10 startups of the LA Auto Show right now. Um, so we'll be down there at the end of this month. Um, we also have been working solidly with tier ones and we're already doing it. I actually had fellows at CES, uh, neuroscientists come down and sit in, in a, on a sofa with the headrest behind them. They start controlling the computer screen in front of them. And I had one of the most, the funniest responses. One neuroscientist looks at me and goes, so where are the switches? Let me see your hands. So I opened my hands and I said, what are you talking about? Yeah. He goes, this is magic. You can't do it. I said, you're doing it right now. You're controlling it. I can see that, but you have a switch. And he stands up and he flips up the sofa cushion pad yeah. and he says, yeah. where's the switch? I said, there is no switch. You're doing this right now. You can't do it. I said, but we are doing it. Yeah. So um, well, I think if you are familiar with, uh, what was the fellow that wrote uh, 2001? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he, yeah. one of his tenets was new science uh, and the ability to do things differently will often look like magic. It does, it does, and there's gonna be lots of naysayers and it's important to, to push through. You know, and I think a lot of people have um, traumatic stress around um, new science as well because um, like th like Theranos and stuff like that. Yes. You know, so, so, so shit like that comes up and then, um, and then people are like, are like who, who do I trust? And so that's, that's why um, I think another reason why it happens. But we gotta, we have to have open mindedness, but also just enough like neuroticism to be able to really tap into the energy of the other person and, and be like, is this actually you know real? But you also have to have enough discipline in science to dig into the um, the deepest uh, under scientific Good point. understanding. Well, and we don't do any of our own evaluation or analysis on data that are. Uh, per, uh, monitored or, or acquired by third parties. So if an OEM or a tier one, we don't, we don't do that. Because then if we did it, and we, we did that initially on one or two occasions, we sent them back the analysis and it was really good. And they go, well, you make it, you can <laughs> yeah, say yeah. anything. And yeah. that's true. Yeah. So a certain amount of skepticism is very, very healthy. So we sent it off yeah. to uh, University of Connecticut Medical School, um, different places that could evaluate it. Samsung, for example. And they've uh, evaluated and given you. That's where these, when I told you about, uh, yeah, these reports came from outside independent third parties. I'm not, you know, telling you I would do that because, you know, obviously, just like Theranos, you could come up with anything and keep it looking yeah. shining because you're yeah. producing your own results. But we went outside. Yeah. And that's, I think, that's is really the, that's oh, a absolutely. Huge, that's a huge key to this process to building trust. Um, was there something else on the way out that you thought think was important? Of course, on the entrepreneurial push, that was a huge point, is go and execute and don't let people say you can't do it. Yeah, go and execute. You, know, you have to have the right people around you. you. Have people that will support you, whether it's a venture, your lawyers, your family, have people that will definitely support you. And I had been in the field uh, since the mid-1980s, and when I said, well, I'm going to try to do this through the body, I was told by a neuroscientist at Northwestern University, he said, I don't know if you can do it. And why would you want to? We can already get it from the head. <laughs> I was like, but you're missing the point. It's never going to break into uh, consumer use if we keep it on the head. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, oh, yeah, you're right about that. Well, I don't know if you can do it. If you can, I want one. Yeah. yeah. And that's how that all, you know, how yeah. we, we laughed about it and we left it like that. And, of course, we did create it and it has... Uh, the correlates to EEG. Um, we don't call it an EEG monitor. We have to call it a neuro monitor. You're making me really want to to play the games. I really want to play them. Oh, that we can do. We yeah, can, let's. I'll set up and let you sit in front of the headrest, yeah. and you can have at it. Let's do it. It's pretty. Let's, it's pretty let's cool. Let's do it. Let's do that, and then. Um, I would love to, for the people that come into our studio that are venture capitalists or neuroscientists or other prominent folks in the Bay, it would be really good for us to, um, to, to, eat, to have a wearable in, in studio so that they can um, play the game of like the deep sea diver and, and they can actually see, okay, let me, all right, I'll start thinking about, you know, my girlfriend. Oh, it's going up, you know. So if they can actually see and play with it to see if um, that's another way. You get an experiential uh, wisdom of this is truth because I'm experiencing this as truth. 
Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to fluctuate the way that you're describing it. It would have trouble with that if it wasn't, yeah. Right, yeah. right. That you can see. And I'll be demoing that at the TransTech conference tomorrow at, uh, I think it's a little after 2 in the afternoon. I'll be demonstrating it on the big stage, pull someone right out of the audience and have them yeah. control uh, a vi uh, an auto simulator right on the screen yeah. in uh, real time. And then I'll distract them yeah. and you'll see what happens. Um, yeah. So that you can see it can be done in real time. And uh, we've been able to go quite a distance with it. And we continue to improve the hardware because uh, we want to get uh, more Pull detail out of it. from the audience to distract them. Because then they don't, know, then they know that it's not you picking a certain time to distract them. So oh, yeah, yeah. That's an interesting thought. So. Good, yeah, I, yeah, we can do that. That's not a problem. Yeah. That's a, Usually all you have to do is ask them one or two silly questions that they're listening to. And then you yeah, can get yeah, them to yeah, 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 drop it out. It. Yeah. So yeah, I'm making the hardware better. I'm excited to actually see the yeah the hardware as well. Um, okay, cool. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Good questions. Yeah, You've been at this. Yeah, yeah. I've been yeah, to this I rodeo love, before. I, I love I love interviewing smart people. It's it's it, like you were saying before we started. It's just such an honor to be able to do this work. So, um, Peter Freer, what a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You so much. I appreciate for coming it on the show and teaching us about for your logic. So. Uh, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for checking this episode out. Give us a shout out in the comments below. Let us know your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. Um, check out the Fear Logic links in the bio. Also, um, check out Transformative Technology Conference and go and build the future. Go and manifest the future. And build it. Execute. Much love, everyone. Thank you. Peace.